liebe Gäste, liebe Freunde, ich äh, würde euch bitten, jetzt so langsam zu Ähm, ja, liebe Gäste, liebe Freunde, es ist uns eine äh, große Freude, euch hier bei uns, bei Kitev in dem Bahnhofsturm willkommen zu heißen. Einmal äh, die Freunde, äh, internationalen Freunde, die wir haben, einmal die regionalen Freunde, aber auch die lokalen Freunde von hier. Wir ähm, finden es sehr ähm, spannend, diese Themen hier verhandeln zu können, gemeinsam mit euch und ich würde gerne ein paar namentlich jetzt nennen. Ich habe äh, das, glaube ich, gestern schon mal gesagt, ich bin nicht so routiniert in der Moderation und auch nicht in den Ansprachen. Deswegen ähm, probiere ich es aber trotzdem. Wir freuen uns ähm, natürlich irgendwie enorm, dass unsere äh, Gäste von ähm, äh, New Ideas for Old Building, für neue Ideen für alte Gebäude hier sind. Und, ähm, aber auch die Kollegen von ähm, Refugees for Refugees for Co-Creative Cities und ähm, die Refugee Strike aus Bochum, die äh, Interkultur, ähm, Phil aus äh, Phil aus London, aber auch die Gäste aus äh, Italien, ähm, aus Belgrad, die dann nochmal namentlich alle auf die Bühne ähm, ähm, ge ähm, geholt werden. Ähm, Unsere Kollegen Better Together, die ähm, Workshops machen, aber auch die ganzen Freunde von Refugees Kitchen, die auf dem Museumsbahnsteig gerade kochen. Und ähm, ich äh, wünsche ähm, uns, euch auch danach nochmal eine angeregte Diskussion zu den äh, Themen. Es geht im Wesentlichen, äh, gestartet sind wir mit der Idee, wie kann man ähm, die Unterkunftssituation von äh, äh, neu angekommenen äh, vergleichen oder was könnte man äh, im Rahmen dessen ähm, äh, die Unterbringung so gestalten, dass man das auch gemeinsam machen könnte. Die Idee ist gestartet vor äh, einem, einem Halbjahr, ein Jahr ungefähr, mit dem Ziel, dass äh, gerade bei Mängel im Bestand von Gebäuden, wovon wir hier im Grunde sehr viele haben, vielleicht auch die neu angekommenen mit, äh, mit, äh, mit der Behebung von Mängeln gemeinsam mit uns ähm, ein Teil äh, davon zu werden, wie man Wohnraum hier irgendwie gestalten möchte, wie wir wohnen wollen, wie wir leben wollen, aber auch die Fähigkeiten da irgendwie zu, äh, abzuholen, weil wir auch der Meinung waren, bei oder wir haben die Erfahrung gemacht im Umbau des Bahnhofsturms oder also auch bei anderen Bauprojekten, dass äh, da viele Fähigkeiten gebraucht werden, von Tischler bis zum Maurer, aber auch bis zum Elektriker. Oder ähm, wie generell die Frage, wie können wir äh, gemeinsam äh, gesellschaftliche Fragen lösen oder daran arbeiten. Und ähm, ich äh, würde jetzt gerne das Mikrofon weitergeben an unsere Moderatorin. Äh, und vielleicht bitten nochmal die, 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 unsere Gäste und Speziellen, die hier auf der Bühne sind, aber vielen, vielen Dank, dass ihr alle gekommen seid. Hello everybody, this is a short change of plans. I'm supposed to talk a little later because we have a wonderful speaker who is just waiting to give a keynote now and I can tell you it's really, really um, a great speaker. He has a lot to tell. And um, I can announce Phil Wood, but I will announce it later in the round with the other guests. And I hope you all have a good time and inspiration with Phil Woods now. Phil Wood. Thank you. It's great to be back. Great to be back with my friends. Kito, great to be back in this fantastic space. Great to be back in the pot, in the Ruger Beat place, which is very close to my heart. Uh, I feel at home here. I come from Yorkshire in the north of England, industrial place, almost a sister region to, uh, to the Ruger Beat. Every town and city in my region has a twin in this, in this region. So I've been coming here for many years and it's 
It's places like this that have, that have made me what I am. The experiences that I've had, good and bad, of, of growing up in a declining industrial region in, in England, um, have had a powerful impact on me. The, the loss of jobs, the loss of industry, but more than that, the, the loss of, of identity, the need to create new identities, happening at the same time as quite extremist politics from our own mother, Thatcher, at that time, and also combined with large-scale immigration, and so a, a, a multiculturalization at the same time as the local community is looking around for a new identity. That's the world into which I fell <laughs> as I left university. Almost literally fell. I had no job. Nobody in their right mind was going to give me a job in Britain at that time. And so I started looking at empty buildings, of which there were very many in my town. I started get, getting into them, breaking into them, climbing into them, and thinking what could be done. And so from the beginning of the 1980s, I've been fascinated by places like this and the possibilities that they, uh, they give. Um, at the same time, I did have to leave my home, like many people do, because there was literally no money at all in my town. And I came to Germany in 1981 as a Gastarbeiter to Munich to work in a hotel, cleaning bedrooms and toilets. 29 toilets and bedrooms every day I cleaned. It's the hardest work I've ever done. I've never worked so hard in my life. But uh, it was valuable experience, I think, um, for some of the things that I've encountered in later life. I'm going to take you through now some of the things that I've tried to do to hopefully make our cities better places to live in. But even more, I think, than when I fell out of university in 1980, there's even greater change going on in our world now. The speed, the intensity of the movement of ideas, concepts, of capital, of money, of diseases, of good things, of dangerous issues moving around the world. And of course also people, expats, tourists, investors, asylum seekers, migrants, refugees, people on the move, not just from A to B, but from A to B to A to C to D, in a complex web. And it seems at the same time, many of the things that we grew up with, the institutions, the names of people, the brands, a lot of it seems to be melting in front of our eyes. I can't even rely on a banker to be reliable. Bankers were boring when I was a kid. Bankers now are trying to be like pop stars. And they fucked up our whole economy in the process. No wonder. Your average Joe or Jane does things, oh my God, they told me, be a good boy, do well at school, get a good job, get a mortgage, get a house, get a husband, get a wife, get your kids into a good school and you'll be okay. Except, it doesn't work anymore. The deal's off. He's done all those things and yet he's anxious. He doesn't know what the future holds. And my God, did anybody mention this? <laughs> and so it's no surprise in situations like this that we also have this increase in the intensity of local conflicts. Yeah, a lot of it driven by bad politics, but also driven by some pretty deeper fundamental issues too. And what are we going to do about it all? Hey? Well, a lot of people, a lot of politicians, indeed a lot of countries, are saying 
We don't want to deal with all of that, all of that crap. Let someone else deal with that. Let the developing world, let the United Nations, anybody deal with all of that crap. We don't want to. We want to get off. We want to keep things the way we like them. And of course, there's lots of people, very, very clever, wickedly clever people, who are able to encourage you in that opinion. And so, all of that anxiety about climate change, about the banks, about your next paycheck, about whether your kids are taking drugs or not, all of these things can often get concentrated into one fear. And maybe you do want to tell an investment banker that you think he's a shit and that you don't appreciate what he's done to the economy. But how many investment bankers do you meet? Not many. So, in the absence of the chance to speak to a politician or an investment banker, you look around your street and you say, well, what's changed? Why are things no longer reliable in the way they used to be? Well, there must be some correlation, some connection between the fact that I feel really confused and cheated and there's all these new people in the street, in the marketplace. Who are these people? Why are they here? And what have they got to do with me feeling so unhappy? And therefore, it's an easy step, if you're pushed along by those wickedly clever people, to think, yeah, I need somebody to blame. I'm going to blame them, because they're, the, they're easy to blame. And so where does that lead us to? It leads us to extreme measures, things that we would have thought were extreme two years ago, but in August 2015, on the border between Serbia and Hungary, one whole country did say, stop the world, we're getting off. We're not having anything to do with this movement of people. We're going to stop it at the border with pepper spray, and we're going to let the rest of Europe clear up the mess. And that might have seemed shocking to us, but I guess now it's become part of the, the wallpaper of our life. And other countries are going to feel emboldened to behave in the same way. So we have to deal with it. The other response, exclusion is one response from, from countries, from, from politicians, from people who feel like that. And the, the partner to all of that is often this uniformity, but in order to defend whatever they feel they have to defend from all of this frightening change, uniformity is a way to keep it going. What's wrong with uniformity? <laughs> this. <Aww. laughs> I know, it's cheaper now, it's not nice. <laughs> but where does that lead? It leads to this. <laughs> we don't want that, do we? So, it's time to wake up. I guess I, wo I was woken up with a slap around my face at the beginning of the century because I was brought up in Britain to think, yeah, Britain's got it pretty much right. Had a few riots in the 70s, but multiculturalism kind of works. And then in 2001, Britain was swept by a whole new wave of riots, ethnically inspired riots in the old industrial cities where everybody thought everybody was getting on. And we suddenly discovered they weren't getting on at all. And the riots were a result of that. And that made me focus in and think, my God, we've missed all of this. People aren't actually naturally building cohesive communities. And my, my work, which has always been around towns and cities, talking to politicians and people and businesses and civil groups, I had to run around and I said, well, what do you really feel about the growth in migration and diversity? What does it mean for your town? And I interviewed a lot of mayors. 
And I was alarmed to find that quite a lot of mayors were saying, we do see this growth in migration as a threat. And this was before the, the refugee crisis. The majority saw it as a nuisance, not, not something that was going to change their way of life, that was just going to be, make their life a bit harder. You know, talking to government officials, oh well, yes, of course we have to accommodate these new people, but I prefer not to do, have to do it, because it means we have to do things differently. Why can't all of these people learn our ways of doing things? So there was no sense that there was an opportunity arising from that. Even in these old, dying, declining industrial cities that had completely run out, run out of ideas, nobody was looking at the new people coming along and saying, maybe some of those guys have got some new ideas to turn around this shagged out old town. And that's what really depressed me, and that's what really pushed me into doing something I, I never thought I'd do, which was write a book called The Intercultural City. Around about the same time, the Council of Europe in Strasbourg, Council of Europe, different organization from the European Commission. Um, older, bigger, not much money. Easy way to remember them. But, they deal with human rights, civil rights, and they were seeing the same kind of alarming things on the horizon that I was. They said intercultural dialogue has to be the way forward, but what they said is, we're sick of talking to governments about this, because they don't want to listen. They're too obsessed with their own national ideologies. We want to talk to people in cities. The Council of Europe never talked to cities. The first time they said, we're going to reach over the head of these governments. We're actually going to talk to the people where they're, where they're in the middle of the mixing pots, on the city streets, where, where strangers encounter strangers on a daily basis. And we're going to find out what it's really like. We're going to talk to mayors, we're going to talk to people who live and work in those city streets. And that's how, for the first time, a new way of working came about, where we kind of almost tried to bypass the national seats of power in every, in every country in Europe. We said, you, we're going to leave you there. You get on with all the crap that you're, you're, you're spouting, about whether you're for immigration or against immigration, depending on what the, current, the, latest, the latest political position is. And let's form a new kind of relationship between this, this pan-national organization, the Council of Europe, with cities, and the third and important element of that, the civil society. It's not just going to be about governments speaking to governments. It's going to be about saying there has to be a different kind of partnership going on. And there has to be a different kind of conversation as well. It's, not, it's about not just thinking differently about diversity, it's thinking about the city at the same time. Because a lot of good work is done around diversity. Diversity management is a boom industry. And some of you will be involved in it, or have been, or you know people who are in the diversity management industry. And it's a vital industry, but it hasn't got all the, the answers. The danger is it thinks it has, because it thinks that diversity management it's a bit like making sausages. It's about processing. It's about taking materials, raw materials, and processing them into good citizens. And of course, people need to be able to function in, a, in where, wherever they arrive. I need to, and I was a gas starbiter in Munich. But if that's all it's about, then actually it's dehumanizing and ultimately it's going to be counterproductive if you simply teach, treat people like that. And so the way we devised intercultural cities is to say this is a much deeper, much more systemic, much more holistic way of thinking in a new way about how the city operates and how relationships between newcomers and host communities operates within that bigger system.
And this is where the, the project was born in 2008, so we've been going for uh, eight years now. I guess if I was to say, what, what, what are we really trying to change? It's trying to get beyond the sense of the newcomer as someone with needs. Yes, many people do arrive with needs, often very serious needs, but those people are not defined by their needs. They didn't always have needs. They won't always have needs in the future. Everyone, no matter how tough their life has been, also has resources, also has something to give, and they want to give it. Too often, the diversity management industry, the integration industry, doesn't give people the opportunity to give. It doesn't even ask them if they've got anything to give. And the whole language that develops around the diversity management industry therefore shapes the reality both of the people who run it and of the people who are processed through it. And if our focus becomes so narrow, then we miss everything else that's going on. <coughs> and if you look out on a city and you could, you could go to the top of the tower today, and we could look out of, on Oberhausen, and we can say, how do we define Oberhausen? And you could draw up a list immediately of 20 things that are wrong with Oberhausen. 20 problems in no time at all. And that could be the end of the conversation. And we could say, great, we've got our list, 20 problems, 20 priorities, let's get into all the housing and sort it out. That could be a job for life, couldn't it? Yeah. Fantastic. And let's face it, that's what we all do, isn't it? <laughs> we get up in the morning and we think, ah, what does the day hold? <laughs> Get to my desk, give me a problem to solve. I eat problems for breakfast. Give me another one. Three solved before lunch. That's what we do, isn't it? And we're good at it. We wouldn't be here if we weren't good at solving problems. But if we allow problems to define our way of working, our way of thinking, our attitude to the world around us, then everything becomes a problem, isn't it? But what if we started to define our world, then yeah, quite easily, you can come up with a map, a map of Overhausen, which draws up statistics, graphs, data very quickly. You know exactly what's wrong with this place, you go out and deal with those things. And I'm not trying to minimize any of these things. They're significant. But we could draw a very different map of Oberhausen or anywhere else, which can and say, well, what are the assets of the people in the city of Oberhausen? What are the things that people have got to give? What are the things that we've never even asked or never even tried to look for? They're out there if you know where to look if you ask the right questions. All this is coming around to the idea of what, what I call diversity advantage, that everybody's got to, something to give, and when you mix people of diverse backgrounds together, they've got even more to give, because whole new hybrid innovations come out of that. What do we think about when we think of innovation? We think of some piece of technology, don't we? Some some snappy app for the, uh, the iPhone. That's what innovators do, isn't it? They make things for iPhone. Is that all innovation is about? No, I'm interested in other kinds of innovations too, social innovations. Innovations that only people with a different insight can actually bring to a situation. Let me talk about the city of uh, Genova in uh, northern Italy, big port city. This woman, I like, I like her, she's a politician, okay, that's the way politicians have to dress in Italy and that's the kind of thing that she has to do as the deputy mayor for, uh, for immigration and integration. But this woman's got a really interesting insight into what 
diversity and, and migration means for her city, because she's frustrated with her city. She's frustrated since she became a politician that she can't get things done in her city, because the system won't allow it to happen. The, the system is there's an almost built-in inertia in the system. Change cannot break through the systems in there. And what does she say? That we don't assume that the migrants will be like us. The public sector is beginning to look like it's irrelevant to the lives of citizens. We need more elasticity to break the rules, the old ways of failing. That's a politician saying we have to break the rules to get anything done in this city, in this system. And how sh who's going to be our biggest helpers in doing that? The migrants. Because they come in with a different perspective. They are vital to the political life of Genova. Because they raise their voices. They don't take crap in the way that maybe long-term Italian citizens of Genova have taken crap from the bureaucrats in the past. They know the migrants won't accept that as the norm. They say, I demand better from a public servant. And they get it, and she wants them to get it. And she's, she's is in alliance against her own bureaucracy in order to make things change. That's an innovation. That's much more important than those kind of innovations, right? as far as I'm concerned, in terms of making, in terms of making cities work. Okay, let's get, get a bit more technical now. Cities run on policies, countries run on policies. And those policies are all different around the world. We're never all going to do everything the same, thank God. But nevertheless, we can learn from past mistakes. I was a gas star biter. There was about a million gas star biters came to the Rudy Beak too. And uh, it seemed like a good idea at the time to bring workers in. But what it didn't encourage was any kind of citizenship, any kind of uh, buying, any, cul any cultural connection. And therefore, when the economy changed, a lot of people felt completely rejected. In France, they thought they could do things better than that by making everybody French, welcoming everybody into the country, not just here as a worker, you're here for good, but you can only stay on one condition, you must be French. All that African nonsense, leave it behind. All that Russian nonsense, you won't need that anymore. You're French. I'm afraid this is a failed system, and we're seeing the terrible, terrible death agonies of this system in France now. France is fighting to keep this whole system going, and it's not going to work, and it makes me sad to see that France will not learn that this system is never going to work. Being a smug Briton in the 1990s, I thought Britain had the answer in multiculturalism. That everybody was welcome, everybody became a citizen, everybody got encouragement to retain their cultural diversity, their religion, their language, and protection under the law from discrimination. And that seemed to be going fine until the, the petrol bomb started flying in 2001. And then we realized that what had happened was that everybody did have a lot of independence. But nobody had learned any kind of common language of communication, of solidarity, of empathy. Everybody was just in their own box. And the power structure wanted to keep them in that box. And all the money and all the status was dispensed to them on condition that they retained their absolute distinctiveness and separation from any other group in the community. And that's what went, that's why things started to come apart and the economy started to come apart. And so for all those reasons, we have to take what's best from the old system, but try and shape it into something new. I'm not coming here offering intercultural city policy as Nirvana, as a city of, a, of, of heaven, it's not. The intercultural city 
is a complex, messy, argumentative, noisy place. Because it's full of people all arguing and saying, listen to me, no, listen to me, everybody wants to be heard. But hopefully everybody also is learning a little bit about the other person. They have to, they can't just shut their door to the stranger. They have to get out on the street and be part of that marketplace of life. And that's a big difference with multiculturalism, that it's not static, it's constantly moving. We're all moving, we all have multiple identities. And therefore in, in policy terms, it offers economic, civil, social, cultural rights, but it also encourages all, us all to get out there and form a, a community together. Now, being English, we can tend to sit back and think, yeah, well, it'll all work itself out. Just have a cup of tea, old boy, and things will sort themselves out. Well, they don't. We have to take action. And that's not just government, and it's not often principally government, it's us. We have to get out there, and we have to give re people reasons to want to interact. Reasons to want to meet a stranger. Because meeting a stranger is a risky business. It's much easier to spend all your time with people you know. Because as soon as you meet a stranger, you don't really know what the right thing to say is. And even if you do say something that you think is right, it may come out all wrong in your mouth. Or they may hear it completely differently from the way you intended it. And then you think, oh my god, why did I say that? And you just want to crawl up into a little hole and die. And so it's much easier not to talk to a stranger at all. And then you don't even put yourself into those awkward positions. And it's no good government saying, you must mix by law. It ain't gonna work. People are gonna say, don't you tell me what to do with my life. And so we have to be clever, we have to be subtle. And we need places and institutions and agents to encourage all of that. And so this is what Intercultural City is about. It's about cities acting as laboratories. It's not about all the best cities. It's all kinds of cities from very different places in Europe and beyond. A hundred cities now, from right across north, south, east, west, small, large, some very advanced, some at first base, really, just starting out. And now, and now cities from around other parts of the world as well. And I'm sure many of you are living near or in some of these places too. And the main thing is that they're prepared to be a bit honest about things, that they're not just there to say, oh, well, we're fantastic at dealing with migrants, we've got all the right answers. It's about cities who've got the courage to say, well, actually, we got this wrong, and could you come and help us try to figure out how we can get it right next time around? So the kind of things that we do is put on events, meet in each other's cities, uh, Meeting places occasionally like Brussels, although I hate going to Brussels, but sometimes you've got to go there to, for next week, social innovation for refugee inclusion, which is going to be a really, really exciting event where social innovators from all around you are going to be coming. And um, I'm afraid it's closed now, the event's closed, but if you want to follow it, you can actually watch it live streamed. And it's going to be an amazing uh, event, actually. So uh, if you want to, if you want to get, if you want to be there, try and get onto that website next Monday or Tuesday. Again, as I've said, it's not all about structures and policies and systems. It's also about people. It's about individuals and groups who are prepared to put themselves out there and take risks to actually cross some of the boundaries that we create for ourselves to actually break the rules, even when we're told not to. And actually it's a risky business being an intercultural innovator because you're putting yourself between two places. And being in the middle of those two places is a dangerous place, it's a scary place. And often you can end up being rejected by both sides. And so those people, they need a lot of help. And they're often the last people who get it because they're often seen in their own community as difficult people. 
often the local authority or the government officials say, oh yeah, her, oh god, yeah, she's got a big mouth, hasn't she? She's always shouting about this and that and the other. Oh no, we don't really want to get involved with people like her. But it's often people like her that are in the middle there, taking the biggest risks of all. And let's never forget that. So, what does an innovator look like? Well, of course, as I said, innovation is about this, so innovators look like that, don't they? Yeah? Sure, fine. Three social innovations a, a day these guys are coming out with. Okay? <laughs> they not all, not all innovators are hipsters. They don't all live in Berlin or Amsterdam, do they? Some of them live elsewhere. Some of them live in places like Serbia, in towns that you may not even have heard of. But Subotica, one of our founder member cities, uh, a place of historic mixing, but a place that was affected by the Yugoslav civil war, and that um, resulted in a lot of people being moving out and a lot of people moving in. This man doesn't look like a hipster, because he's not, but he is a very courageous social innovator. He represents a large community of refugees, people who were driven out of Bosnia and Kosovo as, 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 as Romani gypsies, and ended up in Subotica. And he realized that in this former multicultural city of Serbs and Croats and Hungarians, they all hated each other, but there was one thing they all hated even more than each other. They all hated him and his gypsy community even more. Nobody would talk to them. And yet, they all lived side by side in a community that was falling apart because government wasn't working, because nobody was talking to each other anymore. Nobody was repairing the streets, nobody was repairing the schools, the lights. His kids had to go to school. The road was full of water. But so were the Serbian kids, and the Croatian kids, and the Hungarian kids. Nobody could get to school, but nobody was fixing the fucking road either. So he said, well, if you guys aren't going to do it, then the, the, the gypsies will. And so one weekend, he got together a group of gypsy people, some shovels, a digger, some black stuff, and they started to fix the road themselves. And who came along? Word very quickly got to the mayor. The mayor said, what are you doing? It's my job to fix the road. Why are you fixing the road, gypsies? Go back to your homes. And they said, well, I'm sorry, Mr. Mayor, we don't want to undermine your authority, but our kids can't get to school. And neither can the Serb kids. And what, he, what, what they noticed was that during the day, Serbians and Hungarians and Croatians had actually joined in fixing the road together. The first time that the four communities had done anything. And the mayor realized, and the mayor was big enough to say, okay, maybe I look like the loser here. I could get tough, I could say, get out of it. That's my job, but he didn't. He was bigger than that, and he was big enough to say, I acknowledge that there are times when a community effort from below is the only way to break the ice. And the fact that you've created something that I couldn't as mayor, you've created a for community collaboration on doing something for a community that I couldn't achieve. And on the basis of that, he said, I want you to form a neighborhood group, a fir the first joint committee. I'm going to give you powers over this neighborhood. And it worked so well that other parts of Subotica said, well, we want one of these neighborhood committees too. And so dotted around the city now, almost like going back to it the way it was before the war, are cross-cultural cross places of power, local power. And this is where I wanted to start, rather than talking about hipsters in factories in well-known cities, I wanted to start with unhip people in unhip towns doing unhip things because this is where, is, I think to me, is much more realistic of most of Europe 
where most people are going to have to live and work together. So I think what we learn from a place like Subotica is the innovator is, is, is important and the, the point of being both an insider and an outsider at the same time. To be able to see the things that other people cannot see, to appreciate the things that other people have missed because they're too busy defending their own point of view. But then finding something of common concern, in this case the fact that everybody needed to go down the same road. It didn't matter if you were a gypsy or a Serb or a Hungarian, you all still got wet feet. Find that common concern, find a shared solution, and then try and get the institutional endorsement of the mayor or whoever the authority is, and then find a way of scaling it up and replicating it. Neighborhood committees across the city. And that is a way to get the buy-in both from the community and the politicians. It's going to be a long, hard, messy road for somebody. I mean, it's not out of the, the mud yet. But for me, it's, 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 it's an inspiring example. I like politicians who are prepared to, uh, to admit their own limitations and to admit that they need to behave differently and to work with, with different people in different ways. This was uh, former Deputy Mayor of, of, of Rotterdam, Corrie Lawes. And um, she, would, she encouraged us uh, to come in because she wanted to show us the way that Rotterdam was, was trying to create space for civil society, for, for neighbours in streets to do things differently. She took us to see a project called Cooking With Me. And it, it, it was a typical multi-ethnic, busy, neighborhood in central Rotterdam. Many, many different nationalities living together but not communicating very well. These two people were cooks, chefs, very highly trained chefs. Uh, a Dutch guy and a Turkish woman. And their idea was to set up a restaurant, a, a nice restaurant on a street corner. There are very many nice street corners in Rotterdam. But when they started looking around the, the neighbourhoods and they found a place they thought would make a good restaurant, they thought, yeah, but really this is a really incredible kind of a rival city kind of neighbourhood here. There are people coming in here from all parts of the world and yet it doesn't feel right. And is, is a restaurant, is this going to be the right place for a restaurant? <coughs> At that point they could have said, no, let's go to a bourgeois place part of town instead. But they didn't. They changed their concept and said, what could we do with our, our cookery skills in this particular multi-ethnic neighborhood? And so they altered their plans from a restaurant to a public kitchen and said, how can we use this kitchen and how can we tr use the training of, 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 of cook cookery to become a part of cohesion in, in this community? And they started with kids, of course, because kids is the place to start. And they thought they were going to be full of, of girls, and certainly a lot of girls did come along. But what amazed them was how many boys wanted to learn cookery. They, they tell me about kid, these boys leaving school and racing down the street to be the first to get to the, the kitchen, to get their, their clothes on and to to start cooking. And of course, once you've got the kids hooked, the parents come along out of curiosity. What's going on? Why is my boy talking about food all the time? Why does he want a set of cookery knives for, for his birthday present? What are you doing here? And so this became the next stage of, of, of development with, with, with parents coming in. And of course, once people had started feeling really proud of uh, their cooking kitchen, they started to look around the streets and say the streets look really bad. Why don't we do something about it? Well, the council said they would do something, but why don't we just do it anyway? And so people did. The kids from the, from the cookery school started to tidy up the streets, started to plant them out. And then people got the ideas, well, where does the food come from that we want to cook with? Why don't we start growing our own in, in this wasteland, in the middle of these four-sided blocks? was jungle 
because nobody was spending any time taking care of these places. And so the kids started digging and cultivating. And they've now gone on to a project called Harvesting with Me. How long have we got? How long have we got? Um, I'm going to take you through a town that I know quite well, Dewsbury, uh, an old industrial town. This is a website from Korea. They said, Dewsbury, seen as a symbol of all that's bad in 21st century Britain. It's twinned with Bergkamen, by the way, near, near Dortmund. Uh, it was seen as bad because it was a place where the leader of the seven... Uh, uh, the, the, the 2005 tube bomber lived, as well as a, a crazy white English woman who kidnapped her own kid and hoped to sell her story to the papers. So, it's one of those towns that the newspapers love to hate. <laughs> and it was portrayed as full of stupid, ignorant, white working class people and lots of closed minded uh, Muslim Gujarati people. Uh, two, uh, two communities who never communicated with. With, with either. I worked on a project called Renaissance, um, which was a bottom-up kind of project because the city council was paralyzed by fear. The media had kicked the shit out of the, of the, of the council because of these bad headlines. The city council didn't know what to do, and so groups of, uh, of professionals and, and civil society groups came together and said, we'll have to start ourselves. We'll start talking to people asking people what they want. And of course people started asking for the obvious things. So bad was the, 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 cult, the intercultural relations in, in that, that town that this man had no problem whatsoever having his photograph taken, having said that what does this town need? No packies. It, packies is a very bad word. It's like saying no niggers in, 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 in Britain. He had no problem saying that. The town was falling down. Shops were dying on a daily basis. People were feeling really bad. And so what we started was saying to, to, to owners, give us some access to these spaces. Let, let us into these, these, these places. We can't pay rent, but can you just allow us to, uh, to clean them up? You're familiar with all this kind of stuff. I know you are. So I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna talk at length about this. You've, many of you have probably been involved with similar things to this. But this was new for this town, very new for a very a place very similar to Oberhausen, really, Dewsbury. So this was this was quite radical. People were lit, sat up and listened, and it, it was the opportunity to grab the attention of different kinds of people, to to bring together groups who never met, because there was nowhere to meet. There was no forums. There were no reasons for people from different communities to meet, and so this became the pretext for people to, to, to come together for the first time and talk about how we were going to save this town. One of the assets of the town, and this is very much about looking for assets, was the market. But there's nothing worse than a market when it's not market day. It's, it's empty and useless. And so we started to open it up for common causes. And what is one common cause that goes across cultural divides? interest in fabric, interest in needlework. And so regular needlework sessions, and again in the evening using the, the market uh, benches for special gatherings of people, creating a little bit of theater as well, making make it something really unique. No one's ever had a dinner like that in Dewsbury before. But the main thing was to, to really deal with the empty shops and to try and get a sense that you can do something else with an empty shop rather than just pleading for another national high street multiple to come in and take it over. And this is why we created a completely new kind of shop. First of all, gathering people's attention and saying we can do new things in this place. But then, one day, suddenly pulling off the drapes, and announcing a completely new shop for Dewsbury, the Encounters Shop. And people came along and went, what? Encounters? Is that part of Marks and Spencer's? No, it's a 
completely new kind of shop. Well, what do you sell? We don't sell anything. We exchange. You might have something to bring. I'm sure there's something that you can take from the encounter shop. We didn't drive people in there. We just appealed to their natural curiosity. As people came in, they weren't immediately met by some nice social worker type person. They were allowed to look around, to get the feel of the place. Because as you can imagine, most people were a bit nervous when they came in. What is this place? We asked people to talk about things that made them comfortable. Tell us about where you live, your house, your street, the things you like. Tell us about your assets, your resources, the things that you value, the things that you have to give, the things that you would like to change. And this went on week after week after week after week. People coming in, slowly things changing. Slowly starting to take up the level of activity. Becoming a bit more engaging with people. Ask, tell us about your aspirations for this town. Tell us what's right or wrong. Tell us what you're going to do to change it. And then gradually getting into more kinds of difficult situations. This is an encounter. If this kind of encounter went on in the street of Dewsbury, it could well end with somebody getting their head kicked in. You can see the body language that's going on in this, in this picture. I think it's, 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 it's captured it. These two, these two people here are highly trained mediators. And they're listening and they're managing that situation that could spark just like that. And yeah, all types of different, group, different groups of people who ne would never normally meet were making relationships in here. And what was going on all the time, over the weeks and the months, was all the words, all, everything that people were saying, everything that people were writing, was being gathered in, harvested, day after day. And these people were actually turning it into a piece of documentary, a piece of theatre. And then over two weeks, we ran a whole series of performances where all everybody's words were reflected back at them in this theatre. And people came three times a day for two weeks to watch these performances and watched in utter gobsmacked awe to listen to their own words being reflected back. Both their, their words of wonder, their words of generosity and joy, and their words of anger and prejudice as well. It all came back to them. And they listened, and then they reacted, and they talked, and they talked, and they talked, and they laughed, and they shouted, and they argued, and they laughed again, and then they went home. 11,000. People came to the shop. Uh, all the other shopkeepers in the town were saying, what's going on? What are they selling in that place? <laughs> and then that started, we, once we had that, people saying, well, what next? What are we going to do now? And we, we, we have all this enthusiasm. And so from that group started to form people who, who had ideas, who wanted to make things happen in the town. This was uh, taking a group off to visit another town. Wonderful way of actually breaking the ice in people's minds. People who have, are locked into their own sense of, of hopelessness. Just taking them somewhere else. It doesn't have to be the most brilliant place you take them to. The mere fact of going somewhere else, then being together as a group, then thinking, looking back at their own town from somewhere else, is the magic in all of this. And then them working together, them for the first time having the sense that they've got some agency here. And then suddenly, gradually politicians starting to take themselves, take them seriously as well. Because believe me, when those groups first started, the people who were most worried were the politicians. 
because it was a, it, there was a danger that they'd be saying, well, you failed, therefore we have to act. And the politicians were saying, well, hold on. I'm the person who puts my ass on the line by standing for election. Who are these people? Who elected them? So all of these issues have to be dealt with. But for, for us, I think what, what really mattered was, was really engaging with the passions and, and, and working with people to look for assets as well as problems. To move beyond what we call the usual suspects, whether that's politicians or activists. To be, to be ahead of the politicians, to know actually that innovation is about leading, but don't leave people behind. Just because you've got a great idea, that doesn't mean that people who haven't had that idea are shit. It just means that you need to work together better to do that. And to, to ultimately try and turn those new groupings of people into new democratic institutions. And that, if you're able to achieve all of those things, will be bloody marvellous. Thank you. <laughs>